What did your doctor give you to make you lose all this weight? What, are they, what is your celebrity doctor giving you? Tell the truth. Did no, you get that like, new you shot? Know, pe- people, people on Twitter are like, your your Twitter account sounding a lot more like Jake out. And I'm like, I think, we're on the, <laughs> I think we're on the same diet. I think that's what's going on here. <laughs> In three, two. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the All In Pod with us today. Of course, the Queen of Quinoa <laughs> and from his castle in Italy, <laughs> the cackling uh, dictator, Chamath Polyhapatia, nice gardenias. And back from his big, big battle, his brawl, unblocked and undefeated. The Rain Man himself, David Sachs. And judging by the comments, uh, I'd say dominant. Oh, you read the comments? <laughs> uh, just another sign oh, of your like obsession you with how like you're you perceived. Don't. Like don't you don't. Don't even. I never don't read pretend. comments. Don't pretend. Rule number one, don't read the comments. Well, We're not shows. doing it again. It shows because you're not listening to the comments, so it makes sense. Oh, okay. Go ahead. And, and you got no, your whole troll look, army. Have, how have- many people have you hired on your <laughs> social media team to troll me from anonymous <laughs> accounts on Twitter now to prove your points? Now you're paranoid, too. All right, I'm not going to. Don't be paranoid. Don't be paranoid. Anyway, right, look, we've, look, we've patched things up. It's patched don't, up. Don't break the peace. We have detente. <laughs> All right. So Freeberg is busy uh, writing tweet storms now um, about the drought in California, which seems to be uh, just going to be a really bad year, basically. So Freeberg, walk us through it. How bad is California's drought going to be this year? So the drought is already very bad. Um, I put out a, a lot of tweets at two in the morning last night. I think I drank way too much caffeine yesterday. I'm in the mountains and like the only way I can avoid having headaches is like drinking caffeine all day. And it was a mistake. It kept me up all night. You but- sure it's not the <laughs> Maybe you're so excited about this. <laughs> that you just can't sleep. Nick, you're Nick, Nick, needles. <laughs> Nick, you can beat Nick, this out. Nick, you got to beat this out. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> keep that. Keep that. So. You know, the, the the big tweet storm I put out at two in the morning last night kind of highlighted that there was a paper published in 2018, 2019 that showed how, you know, North America, particularly the Western half of North America is in this, you know, mega drought that we haven't seen in, you know, 500 plus years. And since that paper was published, you know, um, in 2019, conditions have only worsened. I, we talked about this a few pods ago, but like the snowpack level in california reached zero percent throughout the entire state by june 1st that has never happened before temperatures in british columbia as you guys know reached over 120 degrees for several days in a row last week which has never been seen in history in british columbia um you know there was a paper published today that estimates that over a billion um, animals and life forms were wiped out in the coastal region off british columbia because of this heat wave um, and the temperatures in, in California are obviously excessive as well, not as bad as they were last year. But what matters most is that the moisture conditions in our forest land is lower than we've ever seen at this time of year in history. And so this all sets us up. And, 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 and the other kind of big consequence, the high temperatures is causing an increased demand for air conditioners. That's the big variable in power demand on all grids. And the low snowpack means that we're not getting hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power is down by 70% in the state of California over where we were in 2019 um, because there's no snow that's melting causing the rivers to flow. And about 11 to 15% of our state's electricity comes from hydroelectric power. So we're going to have more power demand. We have less power available. We have extremely dry forests. Um, And so this is setting us up for a, a number of possible disasters this year. And so rather than just trying to sound the alarm bells, what I'm pointing out is that there may be some things that we should be thinking about doing to try and get ahead of some of the consequences of these, um, these big risks, like, you know, having enough masks for people to breathe outside. So we don't have to shut down schools and shut down outdoor work and all the things that might happen, having community centers that have power available, the state is scrambling to find excess power on the grid right now. But, um, you know, it it just highlights that there's a moment here that is almost like where we were going into COVID. It may not happen. But the probability is high enough that something bad may happen that we should probably start to get prepared for it you know, we should probably be talking about the things we're doing to get prepared for it. And we're talking about and we should be talking about the things we're going to do to make sure that communities are safe and people are safe and businesses can keep operating. 
Because if the state of California has 150 AQI, which is the air quality index, workers can't work outside. And all the outdoor work, which employs 3 million Californians, has to shut down. And, you know, you kind of start to add these things up. It's like, what are we going to do as this happens, not if this happens? And, and we should kind of be planning for it. Um, and I don't see much happening in terms of planning and, and, and preparation and talking about uh, the opportunity. History rhymes, because if you remember, uh, and this is all going into a recall election in the fall. Uh, this was a different but kind of equivalent setup where you guys remember we were having all these blackouts and brownouts when uh, Gray Davis was recalled. And then Schwarzenegger just swooped up out of nowhere. And, you know, people thought, oh, th there's no chance. And people were just frustrated because the quality of life took a measurable step backwards uh, in the intervening six or nine months before the recall election. And so it'll be really interesting to see how Gavin Newsom manages all of this because if he can't get uh, the states act together, and you have all of these issues at hand, and a credible candidate emerges, um, you could have some really interesting political fireworks in September. A big part of this, correct me if I'm wrong, Friedberg, is that we live in essentially like a lot of desert area here in California, and we just haven't invested in the desalinization plants. We have one that's come on since 2005. And I think there's another one in SoCal that was mothballed and they during the last drought wanted to open it up again. But we now have one in Carlsbad, the uh, Claude Bud, Lewis Carlsbad desalinization plant that is now I think that cost us a billion bucks. But Israel, correct me if I'm wrong, is now they charge three times as much for water than we do. So people take water seriously, and they actually monitor their water usage. And they have desalinization, and they have more water than they need per capita. Well, de desal doesn't really solve a number of these problems that I'm, I'm highlighting. You know, the, the probability of the, the forest land on the West Coast, not just in California, but all up and down the West Coast catching on fire is very high. No number of desal plants is going to put out those fires. When that happens, the air quality is going to get really bad. You know, like we saw last year, I don't know if you guys remember, I escaped to Lake Michigan last summer when the, yeah, the we smoke we remember hit. the threats, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was... Um, it was insane. You know, it doesn't, desal plants don't solve the air quality problem where people can't work outside, your kids can't go to school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, desal plants don't solve the problem of hydroelectric plants, which re requires snowpack to melt to get rivers to run to turn those turbines to generate electricity for the state. Nuclear so, would yeah. solve that though. Nuclear would solve that, certainly. And so, you know, uh, the, the point is we're kind of reaching this apex of are we going to do climate change adaptation? Are we going to have, um, you know, kind of long term systemic solutions that we're going to start to put in place for these risks that we face? And more importantly, from an acute perspective in the near term, what are the actions we should be taking to protect communities and get ahead of this problem? So it's not a scramble after the crisis, which is what we typically do with these sorts yes, of crises. We're, we're not investing in infrastructure. If we put in some nuclear power plants, if we did more desal and we did more forest management or put more fire breaks into, you know, all this. I'm talking about the simple solutions like have but a community those three center. things would be massive, wouldn't they? Well, those are long term solutions. I'm talking yes. about like for this summer. Oh, we for should this have summer? Is it we even need, solvable? We need, we, need, we need communities. No, but we need to prepare for what is going to happen this summer. So when communities get run out, what are we going to do? You know, do we have community centers set up where people can get um, water and power? Do we have uh, masks available so that outdoor workers can keep working in the state? You know, all of these things that we could be doing to get in front of the inevitable consequences of these risks, I think, are things that we should so be actively pursuing. If you're in California, it, you should order your air purifiers now. We ordered six more of these yeah. Conway ones that we used last year that were amazing. Get N95 and masks. I'm doing, we we yeah. have the N95 masks. We ordered them yeah. already. And we're going to put in a power generator, which I know not everybody is able to do. But you can buy a portable one for as little as three or 400 bucks, I think now. So a portable generator in case you lose power, stock up on everything else. We need those solutions. Like I think there's going to be a big kind of power generator push, right? Like distributed power has always been something that's the whole point of solar, you get the solar on your roof, you get your own power. Um, but how are you going to keep your AC running when it's 120 degrees outside if you have no power, you know, that that's kind of a very scary um, circumstance of heat waves. Uh, and it's, um, it's something that we should have a real plan around. And if I were the governor, or if I were kind of California leadership, or leadership up and down the West Coast, you know, the Western governors, um, I'd probably be running a daily press conference starting now, saying, let's just get in front of this problem and talk about what are the risks we're seeing? What are the problems we're seeing? And what we're doing about it, just so people feel reassured, because, you know, scrambling after a crisis doesn't make anyone feel better. 
you know, showing that we're prepared and we're taking action to get in front of this crisis, which is not 100% certain, but it's a greater than 0% probability is something that could helpfully kind of reassure and start to put the pieces in place um, for, for the near term. By the way, just just for those that don't really appreciate how interconnected everything is, the basics, the science basics on drought, as I learned about them, were really, really incredible. So you think, okay, well, how how is all this stuff connected? It turns out that, you know, as we have warmer and warmer temperatures, yeah, uh, I didn't know this, Freeberg, you probably do this, but it accelerates soil evaporation. And then there's this really terrible feedback loop that starts, which is you have drier soil, which means you have less vegetation. And then as a result, you have less what's called evapotranspiration, which means there's less regional precipitation. And then this whole thing just starts to spin and spin and spin. You have warmer temperatures that results in less snowpack. The snowpack, the snowpack melts earlier. And we have a situation now in the United States, which is just incredible. I saw a graph, which is uh, one of soil moisture. And it shows basically the western half of the United States is in the first percentile of soil moisture looking back over many, many decades. So well, and then all of that vegetation dries up well, and then we're becomes in a position, fodder for more fires. No, Jason, we're in a, well, even worse than this, we're in a position where, you know, we are threatening our own food supply. And just just to just to put a uh, a finer point on this it's not just the western half of the united states that's now suffering from this it's brazil it's the mediterranean and southern europe and it's large parts of africa you add up all those number of people there are many countries there that are actually self-sufficient which will then no longer be we'll have to import food that food quality is you know questionable at best in some cases so we're in a really tough position here. And so it's isn't this all solvable with technology? I mean, if we just tax people a little more for their water usage, if we really invested in the desal plants, if we really invested in nuclear, we could actually flip this whole thing the same way it's spiraling in the wrong direction, it could spiral in the right direction. Two things on the water side, I've, I've been looking at water investing for a while. There's a there's a real problem, which is, you know, when I when I looked at this, uh, my team found some incredibly interesting opportunities, largely, it, 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 it evolves around owning water rights, right? And then basically selling them back to the state and when states get in difficult situations. The problem is, I think it's politically intolerable for, let's just say somebody like me, um, to own those kinds of water rights. To be rights. a water and baron, yeah. I, th I, think it's, I think it's no bueno. The, the idea then that I had was like, well, maybe what we should be doing is buying these things and sticking them in a foundation so that we can guarantee water for people in certain states maybe that flies i'm not so sure that's the government's um, job that's the government's job yeah. and but then they're not doing their job but and they're so incompetent they're unfortunately not uh not as skilled as you'd want them to be on this stuff sax how would you spin this uh out of this death spiral and into abundance is there a way well i mean the, the, the first thing to realize here is that this is not a black swan event i mean this is entirely foreseeable um, drought conditions have existed in California for a long time. In fact, 200, 200 years. Yeah. Well, and even maybe going back millions of years. I mean, geologists have found evidence that, you know, millions of years ago, you would have uh, millions of acres of California burning every year. And so drought conditions have existed for a long time. Uh, has climate change amplified that and made it worse? Yes. But this is entirely foreseeable. We know we're dealing with these conditions. And in fact, back on his first day in office in 2019, Newsom held his very first press conference about this issue on emergency preparedness for fires. But the problem is there has been no follow through. And so, um, you know, to go back to Chamas' point about the political ramifications here, you could have a Gray Davis-like situation with the recall where all of a sudden Newsom goes from being the favorite to potentially losing because of fire season. Um, but, but by the way, I mean, the whole reason why the, the recall election is happening in September now instead of October, November is because Newsom is precisely worried about the Gray Davis scenario. And there are, this recall is supposed to happen in the October, November timeframe. They've moved it up to September because Newsom thinks there's a higher chance of fading the worst of fire season by doing the election sooner. The problem for him is that fire season now starts in August. And so we could be in the middle of fire season when this recall election happens. And this thing could boomerang on him. But back to the point about, you know, Newsom held this press conference back in, in January of 2019. And the problem is there hasn't been any real follow through on forest management. So, you know, Newsom was recently caught in a lie 
saying that you know they had basically treated 90,000 acres. This is what this uh, article I'll put in the chat said. In reality, they only really treated about 11,000 acres. Even 90,000 would be inadequate, right? They're not doing enough. And the way, um, you know, I talked to a very prominent person who knows California politics well and knows all the players. And what he said is, look, the fundamental problem is that Gavin is not operational, right? He's fantastic at fundraising. He says all the right things at press great conferences. Hair, great hair. But, but not everything is about running for reelection. And the problem is he has not managed to this outcome. And, and so now we're in the situation where to Freeburg's point, we're going to be scrambling after the fact. Now, what is Newsom's excuse going to be? It's going to be, you know, climate change. It's going to be global warming. It's kind of the all-purpose dog ate my homework excuse for anything that goes wrong is that he can just blame it on climate change. But the reality is we knew about climate change. Climate change is something we're going to have to live with. Even if we stop it in its tracks from this point forward, we're not going to be able to reverse the effects it's already had. And so we need leaders who will step up and, and get much more aggressive about preventing this problem. I think my, my, and by the way, my tweet, I didn't mention climate change at all. I got, you know, I don't think that that's even the point. The point is we are facing acute conditions on the, in the Western half of the United States right now that lead to a number of significant and severe consequences. Those acute conditions, you know, you could blame them on climate change and say that they're a part of climate change. It doesn't change the reality. They are here today and we have to deal with them. Um, and I think, yeah. We have a we have a couple of things that are that are uh, going to happen here in short order that I think can make this thing accelerated a little. So there's a uh, an organization, a, a department in the United States government that's not very well known called the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation (USBR), and they are the ones that will make formal assessments of water levels. And there's a really important assessment that's going to happen in Lake Mead um, at the end of this year. And the reason why it's critical is that if the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation measures Lake Mead under um, a certain threshold, uh, they can declare a tier one shortage. And what that means, just practically speaking, cutting through all the you know jargon, is that initially the state of Arizona will be denied around 600,000 acre feet of water next year. What does that mean? That's about 15% of the demand for that state. And so you're going to start, you know, to deal with these sort of like rolling, I don't know what we're even going to call these water out scenarios where uh, it's not just about watering your lawn, that's not going to be possible, it's going to be a whole bunch of other things. Now, there is a solution. And this is where California can come to the rescue for most of the Western United States if they really want to, or at least for the rest of California, which is there is an enormous untapped groundwater uh, aquifer in Southern California, which is the size of Lake Mead. Um, it's an incredibly unique thing. It's actually owned by a public company. And the whole goal was, okay, well, let's just build a pipeline, right, from the aquifer to deliver drinking water to folks that, you know, are lacking water. Um, and this has been a multi-year, you know, bordering on multi-decade slog because of California politicians. Because water be has become highly politicized. No one wants to pay the full cost for a commodity that they frankly view as a right. But then they don't want to step in to do the work to actually make it reasonable and viable. So this whole thing is just, again, as David, as you said, the dog ate my homework. And now we're really playing with some very complicated things that are really out of the control and intellectual capacity of the, of frankly, state governments, which is the interconnectedness of Weather, temperature, water, our soil, our food supply. It's a, uh, I, th I think. What's so frustrating yeah. with this is this is so easily it's solvable. Crazy. And we are not doing the blocking and tackling, the free throws, the basic things. If you look at um, just monitoring our water usage, um, I invested in two companies. One of them um, didn't work out, um, but both of them were to monitor water usage. And what we learned was at a campus like Stanford, they have like four water meters, like th they're not going down to the building level in some cases, there'll be like four buildings on one water meter. And you can very easily at each sink at each, you know, shower head, you can put a device that cost 25 bucks installed, it just wraps around the the the, the water, the, the the pipe, and it could tell you how it's flowing. And we lose 20 30% of our water to leaks. 
nobody is monitoring their usage because there is no cost to it to Chamath's point. And then you look at these crazy, insane almond and other uh, agriculture in the, the middle of California. They are using flood irrigation, which I'm sure Friedberg can give us an education at versus what you know, the drip irrigation that they use and other reclaiming methods in Israel and other places. So we look at water as like, to Chamat's point, some crazy God given right that we can just splash it everywhere, we can take 20 minute showers. And then we allow how crazy is this, we allow the bottling of water in California, we allow these companies to bottle water and then sell it. And we don't even monitor our usage. We have well, we are biggest so donors. entitled. It is gross. Newsom's biggest donors. Uh, who, who, who's that family that grows all the almonds or whatever? Whoever yeah, the, they are, the, the Resnicks. The Resnicks, single biggest do- them and the teachers' union. Single. Oh, single Linda Resnick donor. and those palm people with the palm stuff. I, I know it's, them. It's, it's it's total political corruption, right? I mean, they get it's Chinatown. It's literally the movie Chinatown. Yeah. Well, I think so to this point about why aren't politicians solving the problems? I mean, to make a meta point, there's a great tweet from Thomas Sowell or the person who manages the Thomas Sowell account, uh, where he said, no one will really understand politics until they understand that politicians are not trying to solve our problems. They're trying to solve their own problems, uh, re-election. W- yeah. which are getting elected and reelected. That's number one. Number Stay two. in office. When, that is their only is number goal. Number three is far behind. And, and that, that's basically the situation we have is. I think Newsom actually is a little bit like Trump, not in his personal style, but in that he thinks he can talk his way out of problems. And he's not going to focus on solving a problem when he can just spin his way out of it. By the way, I, I just think you guys should know the, you know, because a lot of people talk about residential water use. That is also kind of an acute and local problem where depending on your water supply, how much water you have available to your community um, but in terms of aggregate water use, the vast majority of water in California is used in agriculture. Um, it's about uh, 10x uh, what is used for residential um, applications. So yeah. uh, uh, California agriculture, by the way, it's not a bad thing. It's a huge uh, part of our economy. Uh, that water has generally been fully available in aquifers. People bought that land with rights. They paid a premium for those rights to those aquifers. This is a very complicated problem uh, in California. And that, uh, you know, supports a large part of the California economy. So, you know, you can't just kind of blow them away. But 90% of water use in California is associated with ag. And it's not just a generally we need to save water problem. It's very specific to a region and a community and their particular water source on whether and how much you need to save versus do you have abundant supplies and so on. Um, and so it's it's a little bit more complicated, but Sachs, yeah. But we should be you, focused yeah. on abundance, Freeberg. If if you look at the new nuclear power plants that you know Bill Gates has invested in, and then you look at desalinization, which is an energy issue, we can desalinize for roughly two or three times the cost that we're Again, getting like, our water for now. So just put a nuclear power plant next to a desalinization plant, and you're done. Great, that's a twenty year project and you got to why build, why is it a 20-year project china does it in two you we need be, to be more bold in this country it is completely ridiculous that we accept that everything has to take 20 years we need this now where's the leadership that says fuck it let's do it immediately let's set a goal of two years to build 10 of these Jason, and let's I'm not, spend I'm the not, fucking money i'm not sure it solves our acute problems it solves long-term problems associated with climate change and energy we, we and can't do both water, water we can't do both let's do both Sure, we should do everything. But right now, the, you know, the, the conditions indicate that there are some specific things that we can and should be doing to kind of support the state in terms of what's going to happen in the next year or two. And yes, we should also be funding long term projects that create water security and energy security for everyone in the United States. But Sachs, to your point, and, and by the way, if you guys ever want to read an interesting book about how the grid operates, um, there's a book called The Grid. Uh, and it talks about how the electrical uh, power grid system was built in the United States and how inefficient it is and all the problems. There, there are a lot of structural problems that need to be solved, not just, you know, dropping in cheap power. Sachs, who is the good operational candidate that you've seen that's running for governor of California in this recall? Is there someone that stands out in your mind? Because I, I, I don't seem to hear anyone talking about, hey, there's a good alternative to Gavin Newsom right. at this point. Yeah, I mean, we don't, a clear alternative has not emerged yet. Um you know, I guess the and, and part of the problem is that because there was no Republican primary, you haven't sort of consolidated the opposition to a leading candidate. There are a couple of, I guess, interesting candidates on the Republican side. I need to spend more time getting to, you know, know them. I mean, I have never met them or talked to them. But the the two who are, I think, mentioned quite a bit are uh, this guy Falconer, who's the mayor of San Diego, 
who is sort of a socially liberal Republican. And then there's a uh, state assemblyman named Kevin Kiley, who, uh, who I think says a lot of interesting things. And he just announced he's running. There's another guy as well, uh, John Cox, but he got trounced by Newsom in the last election. I think it's time to let somebody else take a shot against him. And then, of course, you've got Caitlyn Jenner, but I think people are still trying to figure out if her campaign is real or how real it is. Um, so, yeah, look, we ha- the, the opposition has not consolidated against Newsom the way it did with Schwarzenegger, you know, back in 2001. And I'm, that, voting, that- I'm voting Republican just to create a counterbalance. I don't care who it is, and I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent, but I'm voting across the board. I'm just going to go to Republican for every position in California, and I'm going to just run my finger down the Republican wow. line and how check it, every Jake single out, one. Jake, how does it feel to be a radical Trump supporter? I, listen, I, I'm not for Trump, but Chamath, talk to us about nuclear and what we can do to get to reverse what these hippy dippy, well intentioned, no nukes concert set us back 50 years. And let's be honest, a lot of the climate change problems we have today, we would not have if we had invested in nuclear. Yeah, I, I sent around. Well, I sent around an image, uh, Nick, maybe you can s- stick it in the show notes or something so that people can see. But if you if you look at if you graph the construction of nuclear reactors from like oh, the 1960s, image, yeah. 1960s to today, essentially what and you color code them by country, what essentially you see is uh, a transition from the able from the frankly from countries that basically were just right at the at leading the pack. And it was really the United States building, building, building. And then two things really happened. There was Three Mile Island, and then there was Chernobyl. And there was an incredible overreaction to not really understanding either the cause and or the remediation to two events. Now, could you imagine if there were two airlines that crashed and we stopped flying? How basically we would have, you know, retarded the progress of the world. And now you impose it on something like nuclear energy which is consistently proven to provide an enormously abundant, cheap, and clean form of sustainable energy. And it actually solves a bunch of the problems we talked about before. So for example, if you look at the power consumption for desalination, it's off the charts, quite honestly. Okay, that's why people say that it can't be done credibly. If you look at even just like the amount of energy that's required to clean water and to, you know, sanitize water and make it drinkable, the 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 standards that are defined by the government are incredibly stringent but the the implication of it operationally is an enormous amount of power that goes into it but jason you are right which is that if we have small forms of sustainable abundant energy that can be basically hyper localized and located where we can do these jobs the jobs to be done it's transformational now why doesn't it happen it doesn't happen because the same folks who really want to sound the alarm bells on climate change which is the progressive left are not really willing, they are intellectually lazy when it comes to nuclear. They don't do the work. They make a bland, sort of broad-based prognostication about how we need to do something about climate. Then they will point to solar and wind without really understanding the contamination of the earth that we do in order to mine the rare earths and the actual metal and mineral inputs that are required for solar. It's nuts. But it it's sounds nuts. better, right? It sounds better. It, it sounds it's better. better. Optics. Oh, oh we're using sun, air and the air, sun, the sun, oh, and water. it's abundant. And yeah. it's like if I could show you what what tailings are and like the dirty after effects of mining copper and nickel out of the ground, which is what we need for batteries, and how countries like Indonesia are literally dumping it into the ocean, dumping it faster than they can get their hands on it, so that they can sell copper and nickel and cobalt. Um, to us so that we can make batteries, you would actually say to yourself, if you knew all these facts, you'd actually say to yourself, you know what, maybe nuclear isn't so bad. And maybe I overreacted to two incidents. If you want to understand this, you just have to look at the laziest group of individuals and society, the French, they want to take the laziest route and do the least amount of work and have the most amount of leisure. Sorry to our French (laughs) listeners. 70% of the energy in France is from nuclear. nuclear, They figured this out. They said, 
How do we take more time off and not work and have unlimited electric? 70% nuclear. They're There's so a, smart. Well, the, 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 the French are actually smart because after They're Fukushima, smart. because after Fukushima, what happened is if you had, you know, sort of like woke politicians, Germany, a bunch of Germany, they completely unwound their entire nuclear agenda. They shut which it was, down. Ugh. Which, which was insanity, insanity. And so now here they are, they're writing laws faster than they can make them up. They're basically pivoting entire industries to try to now adopt batteries and storage without any real understanding about the downstream implications to yeah. the earth that they are going to create. The, net, the, net, just, the, net, the net consequences. If they had just stayed yeah. the course on nuclear, they Ugh. would be in a much better place. And and to France's credit, they were like, what the fuck are you people overreacting about? Again, just think about this, guys. The if pragmatism there was two, is delightful. If we stopped flying after two airline crashes, where would the world be? Where would the world be? I mean, be pragmatists here. W do we want to deal with high energy prices and brownouts and all kinds of problems and rolling blackouts? Or do we want to put this issue behind us? If we just go on a Manhattan project literally to make new nuclear, we would be this issue would be behind us and we could focus on something else like education. It's so dumb. The very scary thing about nuclear is despite all of the progress, it will get bogged down in litigation and bureaucracy. These are the last two things that should be in front of science and physics especially when it comes to energy independence. I just think it's, it's crazy. Freeberg, any way out? Any way we can get people to, well, what's the best way to convince the American public to embrace nuclear and force our politicians to do it? Open your mind and think for yourself. Right. Please. Well, uh, Read Mark, a book. Mark, Mark Andreessen had a good term. Uh, he said we're living in a vetocracy, as in the word veto. Um, I think it, he, it was an interesting interview with um, Antonio Garcia Martinez on his blog. Anyway, um, yeah, they were talking about the inability of the U.S. to build anything anymore, especially when you compare us to some, you know, place like China. And you, whether you want to call it nimbyism or vetocracy, there are just too many people and groups who have the right to say no to anything and block anything important from happening. Um, but we got us, we got to stop letting our politicians off the hook. Um, by making excuses, you know, just because there's climate change doesn't mean that the politicians can't do anything about it. I mean, welcome to the downstream consequences of a successful democracy, right? Like a democracy over time doesn't reduce the number of laws it has. Every year, politicians need to do their job and they create new laws. As new laws accumulate, like the things get clogged up, right? Like when, when have you seen a law that gets passed by a local government, a state government or federal government? That makes it easier to do something. I get that. But where, where does it say in the Constitution of the United States that being part of a democracy also means shutting your brain off and becoming a dumb cynic? Yeah. That's, that's not part of what being part of a democracy is. I, by the way, I want to, I want to talk about that for one second. There was this thing that I sent you guys in the chat and Nick, hopefully you, you post, post that in the show notes as well. But there was a study that was done about cynicism. And it went back and it did like a qualitative assessment of more than 200,000 people and their attitudes and their measured IQ, their measured literacy, their measured numeracy, and their measured earnings. And here's what they found. Cynicism is associated with lower IQ, lower literacy, lower numeracy, and lower earnings. The idea of cynical individuals being more competent appears to be a widespread yet largely illusory lie. So I, I mean, think we have to teach people. I think this makes sense. I mean. I, I was shocked by that study because I actually generally think cynical people must be smarter because they're thinking more rationally and maybe I'm being emotional. It turns out they're fucking stupid. Well, here's the thing. There's cynicism and then there's people who are cantankerous and not content. And I think people sometimes conflate those two things. If you look but at the constant people. constant. Constant pervasive cynicism is not a feature of democracy. It means that you just stop thinking for yourself as a protective mechanism. Right. But, but the people we know uh, who have changed the world and who are, they seem to be. They're not cynical. They're not cynical. They're actually delusional and optimistic or else they wouldn't have started a company to make electric cars, you know, or 
you know, whatever piece of right. software or climate.com or, or synthetic biology, you have to be a radical optimist. I mean, and we're literally trying to attack our incredible capitalists who are actually solving these problems while our politicians can't get their shit together and make desal plants and nuclear plants. It, it, the private market seems like the only solution. Sachs, how do we solve Well, the, 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 there's an old saying that uh, pessimists get to be right and optimists get to be rich. And uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, if you think about it. it, if you think about it, you know, pessimists don't create companies, right? They're they're no, it, they it, throw it, rocks. They become journalists. They become they shit become posters critics. on Twitter. They become critics. critics yeah, Anton Ego, right? right. I, Sa Sachs, what do you think about this idea that uh, you know, if we get into the throes of it uh, for water, the folks that own water rights, I think that this is going to be like an eminent domain issue where. The government is at some point just going to say, sorry, need it back. It's mine. Yeah, during an emergency, for sure. For sure. But I mean, I, 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 hate, to, I hate to use the words, um, I agree with J-Cal, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, look, there's not a shortage of water in the world, right? I mean, the world is mostly water. So it is a function of building desalination plants if that's what we need. Um, there has to be a solution for that problem. And Freeberg's right that maybe it does take a decade or two to, to put in all, place all that infrastructure, but then why didn't we start 10 years ago? You see, we should be starting a program where we convince the American public that abundance would lead to them having more freedom and our country being stronger. Electrical abundance with nuclear, water abundance with desalinization, and agricultural abundance with those previous two. Because if you had unlimited nuclear and energy and you had unlimited clean water, the price of agriculture would go down and we'd have more free food for everybody or lower cost food. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a theory I have on this. Um, and, and it's basically an anti-science theory, which is that, um, you know, culturally, we've kind of developed this anti-innovation, anti-science mentality, broadly speaking, across uh, kind of modern culture in the United States. If you remember coming out of World War II, and I think it has its roots in the Cold War, um, you know, out of when World War II ended, you know, we were all in it together. Uh, you know, this country, everyone bought the same stuff. We all had Rice Krispies every day. We all kind of, you know, were excited about our, our, our homes that look like everyone else's home on the block. And technology was empowering all of this, right? There was a space race on. Um, there were plastics that were suddenly allowing us to make all sorts of amazing things. There were chemicals that were creating new drugs for humans and new applications for agriculture that was making an abundance of food and increasing lifespans and so on. But then what happened in the late 60s and 70s is we realized we got ahead of ourselves. And, um, you know, there was uh, uh, cancer from DDT. There was, uh, you know, Three Mile Island. There was um, uh, a, a number of... Um, pollutants that got into the environment that permanently damaged the environment from chemical companies. And we started to wake up and say like, wait a second, all of this technology that we thought was so great and was giving us this extraordinary abundance, it turns out is really risky and can cause massive unknown consequences. And if you watch, uh, I think I talked about this on our podcast once, but one of my favorite videos to watch, there's a video on YouTube from the Disney Channel History Institute, and they show the history of Tomorrowland at Disneyland. When Tomorrowland opened in 1955, every ride was all about adventuring into space and like traveling into the human body. And they even had a ride from Monsanto where you would go into the micro world and look at plastics and stuff. And it was all about this amazing abundance in technology. And the guy, the, the narrator on the video says, beginning in the late 60s, early 70s, we changed all the rides. And the rides all became about the fear of technology. It was all about aliens attacking Earth. It was all about um, Captain EO was like, you know, the, the world became robotic and got taken over by unnatural things. Even Star Tours was about a robot that went awry. And the robot doesn't know what it's doing. So it drove us off course, and we had to survive the robot. And so everything became, you know, subconscious or subliminally a little bit, this negative technology sentiment. And I think that that still persists, you know, there is an asymmetry, people take for granted the abundance over time, because you get used to it. But you feel the acute pain of the loss when technology goes awry, and then that becomes the social conscience. And I think we're still grappling with that. And I, I don't know how you reverse it. Well, you know what, Freebird, are, so we're ex are we not experiencing this right now, everybody, with COVID, where there's one group of people who are like, oh my God, the science we were able to deploy in COVID and get through this so quickly is so promising that the world's going to be better net net after the pandemic, even with all the suffering 
you could make an argument that that suffering is going to lead to more prosperity. And there's another group of people who are like the Delta variant, let's get our masks back on. Uh, and, and people want to take the Seneca route on as, a, as an individual, I don't want harm done to me or my kids or my environment. That's that's the I think the general kind of conscience, right? And I don't care about the abundance because I've basically taken it for granted. And so now I find myself as an individual saying, you know what, we shouldn't do nuclear because look at what happened at Fukushima. Forgetting the fact that you've been living off of free electricity practically for decades or whatever the, you know, the case and might be. And free water. And free water and all these things. And I think the, the, the abundance that technology delivers to humans, because humans are only programmed to recognize change. They're not programmed to recognize absolutes. Uh, there's a lot of good socio-psychological and, and evolutionary Give psychology us an example of that. Give us an example of that. Like if, you know, if you go to the store every day and you're used to just getting a $1 can of Coke, you don't say, oh my God, I feel it's an amazing world I live in. I get a $1 can of Coke. You never praise that $1 can of Coke. Now, if you went to the store and the can of Coke went up to $2, you'd be like, what the heck? Why does Coke cost so much? And so, um, you know, it, that, so we habituate, but, 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 but here's we habituate the to the great if things the, in our life. If the price yeah. of Coke dropped to 50 cents, you're like, okay, that feels good. And then you get used to the price of Coke being 50 cents. And a few weeks later, if it goes up, you're upset, but you're not as happy on the other way. So human emotion is kind of asymmetrically, you know, defined by these negative consequences. And I think over time, you accumulate these negative consequences as your core psyche, and you have an aversion to doing, you know, innovative things as a whole, not all people, but as a whole, that's how we operate. Um, and it's why technology kind of gets lambasted over over time. I, this is the most frustrating to, thing to me, Chamath, is that we have so many amazing things happening in technology, and nobody will 10x or 100x on them from the uh, government perspective or the public. I had a company called Zero Mass on my podcast, which I think is now called Source, and you're aware of this company. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the impact hydro panels would make if we just embrace this technology. Well, I mean, Sor Source is an incredible, incredible company. Um, basically, there's a there's a guy who runs a Cody Friesen who, when he was at MIT, basically um, developed a uh, essentially a material, a membrane that can absorb the ambient um, water that's in the atmosphere um, and basically allow you to collect it and to separate it into its components and to basically create potable salinized or potable drinkable water in a panel that looks like a solar panel so you put these solar arrays everywhere and out of the back you put a little pipe and it collects the humidity in the ambient air and uh and it spits out water it's it's an incredible thing and he's able to go and rewire schools and and the thing is he can go anywhere because again he doesn't need anything right you literally put it on your roof it's incredible and it makes you if you i think he told me at the time when I interviewed him two or three years ago, he said you could put two of these on your roof and get like four cases of bottled water a day, no matter where you were on the planet. And by the way, he's moving to a place which is really cool. He told me this. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, but I'll say it anyways. Are you saying this might be beeped? No, where he's got a beep he, candidate? He'll, no, he'll have an eventual app where you can kind of direct the, the hydro panel to make the kind of water that you like. So if you Ooh, love alkaline. Evian... Or if you love um, Dial it Fiji in? water, or if you love smart water, or you're on the Voss, you know, right? Spe specifically because it's the most expensive. No, I, I love I love smart water. <laughs> I, I I have a very gratuitous reason why. I remember <laughs> when I met Jobs, he drank smart water, and I thought, "Boop, is good enough for him. Is good enough for me." <laughs> I'll tell you when I knew Chamath. <laughs> I just gotta copy people. I, you gotta copy the good ones, and I was just I'm, like, "This um, is a personal anecdote." This is when I knew Chamath made it. We used to play poker in his garage in his little three thousand square foot Palo Alto house. Little no, in Burlington, 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 in Burlington, whatever. He had this little tiny house. And we're in the garage and he's like, look, I'm putting up a flat panel. I'm going to like paint the walls. No, we had a little, uh, you had a little uh, easel and you'd write on chalk how much you owe, yeah. you know. Then Chamat's like, I got a new house. <laughs> and beep. He's got his new house. We come over. He's like, Jake, you want some water? I'm like, yeah, I'd love a glass. He's like, oh, Jake, you want a beverage? I'm like, yeah, I'll take a glass of water. And uh, he goes, oh, and he walks over to a rack. And in the rack, like, you know, those things you push <laughs> wine on, there's a rack for water. And there is Voss in the glass bottles. There is Evian in glass bottles. All, and you're not like the Evian that you get at the regular supermarket. Like somebody sourced the Evian bottles that restaurants have. And then he had the smart water. I mean, there's six. And I'm like, I just wanted a glass of water. But okay, I'll take the Evian in the glass bottle. It was delightful.
Sax, I got three different bounce passes I can give you just where you want it. Do you want cancel <laughs> culture? Do you want Chessa Budin or COVID? What do you want? Or COVID? I can give you any of these. I can. I'm ready to pass. Uh, I'm talking about any of those sound good to me. I mean, right. the, I, the, the, it might be time for a Chase update because we haven't done that in a while. The killer DA? The killer DA, yeah. Oh, by the way, I just want to say I found the journalist. You know the journalist, Sachs. Don't say her name. And she is setting up her LLC and the $60,000 we raised from the GoFundMe is going to go to her to cover the DA's office for the next six to 12 months in a newsletter website. Right. And just to be clear, because I think people kind of misinterpreted what you were trying to do there with the GoFundMe, J. Cal. Yes. This is not for opposition research. This is not no. dig- This is not digging up dirt. This is reporting on, uh, on public policy, on pu- what should be public facts with respect to what the DA's office is doing, how Chesa is performing in his job. Isn't it interesting, though, how the left journalists, when I hired investigative journalists to cover criminal justice, accuse me of hiring an oppo researcher and these are investigative journalists and well, i told them not- explicitly i'm just hiring an investigative journalist to cover crime in san francisco there's no oppo research here and they insisted on saying i wanted to get into chess's personal life and i yeah. explicitly said that's not what this is for well let's face it there aren't too many journalists anymore who are investigative who are actually in the business of turning up new facts about elected officials they're too busy pushing a narrative they're engaged in agenda journalism and actually, we saw a really good example just to tie into to what's hap- what happened over the past week is you had this story in the San Francisco Chronicle, which is basically pure propaganda uh, from, you could see the, the, um, the passing from Chesa to this reporter of this, this farcical uh, claim that crime is falling in San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this claim is so preposterous. We, this is the same week we saw viral videos of 10 robbers bursting out of Neiman Marcus, you know, with... With every handbag. With, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, plus you had the viral... It was scary. Yeah. You had the viral video of the, the guy going into CVS and just, you know, it wasn't even shoplifting. It was... It was How, did you see Brian bags. Sugar's uh, video of the person who broke into his house? stole his kids ipads and everything while they were in the house right and cyan banister who had another home invasion just tweeted home invasions are now um not prosecutable crimes in san francisco well no what they're doing is what cyan reported about her case is and by the way her case is in the public eye okay so it's very brazen for the da to be doing this but what they did is they dropped the home invasion charges and they're just treating it as Basically, a, a theft of, you know, a few hundred dollars, you know, that does not capture the violation of breaking into someone's house and how dangerous that is. But I, originally, I thought, okay, why is the DA's office doing this? Originally, I thought, well, maybe it's just because, you know, Chase doesn't want to incarcerate anybody, but it's more than that. You see, if they drop the charges down to petty larceny, then he can include it in a different stat. You see, Home burglaries are up by some gargantuan amount, like 50% year over year. Oh. They want to be able to claim crime is falling. And so now they're juking the stats by reducing the charges from the more serious crime to the less serious crime. And then what wow. they do is- They're shaping the stats. They're juking the stats. You ever watch the, the show, The Wire? That's where this expression comes from, is you know first- the, the politicians get held, held accountable to the statistics. Then they realize that. Then they start manipulating the facts. And that's what's basically so been dirty. Happening. It's so dirty. But, but the next step in the process is they then feed these juke stats to these compliant reporters. I mean, the fact that they keep repeating these statistics as going down when people are stopping reporting crimes because they won't prosecute them, right. then they mischaracterize them. And then they never say 85% of the commuters coming into San Francisco are no longer coming into San Francisco and Target announced like Walgreens that they are either closing stores or reducing the hours because they can't deal with the crime. And they're right. saying explicitly, this is the highest crime we've ever seen in any of our stores. And then this crazy right. communist, are they communists on the left here? C- CVS, Walgreens and Target are all closing stores or reducing store hours um, because they understand the hit to their bottom line. But you have this mantra it is, it is communist-like, where it's like the commandments written on the barn in Animal Farm, 
where it is propaganda that's so at odds with reality, it's just absurd, okay? It's farcical. It's yeah. farcical. But then how do they enforce it? What they say is anybody who questions this narrative is a bad person, is in fact a Klansman. Racist. A racist and a Klansman. So, so this is the other thing that happened over the past week is that you had- This is crazy. Basically, Michelle Tandler, who is a moderate and as nice a person as you could ever find. Concerned citizen. Concerned citizen. San Francisco, born and raised. Yes, who tweeted that all of her friends are thinking about leaving the city. And then in response to that, you had this this uh, senior policy advisor to Chase Boudin who works for the DA's office named uh, Kate Chatfield, attack her, basically implying her views were, you know, were KKK values for, for, for having the audacity to warn that people are worried about crime in San Francisco. So she gets attacked. By the way, uh, this this Chatfield person, the top of her profile is the clenched fist of the communist revolution, J. Cal. So <laughs> this is who's oh, running the Lord. DA's office. But but look, it's not just trolling th- and it's not even just slander. It's, I think, an abuse of power for someone in the DA's office to go after and attack a concerned citizen like this. Okay. But this is how they enforce. Can the- you read the tweet that she did? Do you have that there? Because yeah. she basically is. The people who have experienced home invasions are concerned for the safety of their families. And what this uh, woman did, Michelle, I believe is her name. She just said, like, people are scared for their families. And then Kate Chatfield referenced birth of a nation and compared her to, oh, our wives are not safe because of black people. And that's a KKK Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation. Everybody understands what Birth of a Nation is. Yeah, the original name of Birth of a Nation, I think, was the Klansman. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a KKK piece of propaganda. Wow. But it's really outrageous. She just blocked me. Kate Chatfield blocked me. Wow. This is a public policy advisor who is now hiding her account. Well, I mean, a public official should not do that. I mean, they should be- And so this set you off. Let's be let's be honest. Well, it set I, you I, off. I, I know Michelle Tandler. She worked at Yammer, you know, and I didn't. I thought it was out of bounds for uh, not just a public official, but someone Crazy. in the DA's pro, uh, office who so has what did the you power. Do? Well, I just you don't. went into revenge mode. Let's no, be honest. No, I do- you got a little bit. You were a little bit tweaked. I donated another fifty thousand dollars to the Recall Chaser campaign, and you dedicated it to Kate. Yeah. You said, this is for you. Yeah, because look, the, this is threatening. Every American should have the right to criticize their government without having its law enforcement arm come down on them. And so here you have a legitimate concern expressed by a private citizen, and the DA's office is coming down on them. That's not acceptable. I think I need to break some news here. I didn't want to talk about this publicly, but I'm so outraged now that I think I should let this out. So while I, after the week, in the weeks after I started that campaign to hire an investigative journalist for Chess's office, this is breaking news. I haven't talked about this publicly, but I'm going to break it now. Do you know who contacted me? The DA's office. Do you know what they contacted me about? They were investigating a startup that I had invested in. I won't say which one. And they wanted to interview me about my involvement with that startup because that startup uh, had some complaint from a downstream investor who felt that they were committing some type of fraud or problem. Coincidence? Are, are, are you serious? I'm dead this, serious. This is literally becoming Chinatown. They literally tried to intimidate me and I, I didn't want to bring it up. And I talked to the person on the phone, the, 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 the person from the DA's office who was investigating this. And he's, I was like, do I need an attorney for this? Why are you calling me? Because and he's like, well, you know, we just want to talk to you about this. And I was like, yeah, no, like we have a bunch of questions. And I just said, you know what, Uh, subpoena me. I'm not, you know, (laughs) file something and I'll come in with my attorney to talk to you, but I'm not going to talk with you on background. No. So they literally tried to intimidate me. You know what? And I kind of let them because I didn't want to make it public. But I'm making it public now. You should make it public because it's public now. Well, because and this is two weeks after I said let's hire the journalist. It's intimidation tactics. It is I will intimidation not be intimidated. tactics. That's intimidation, yeah. I will not be intimidated, Chessa. All right. <laughs> but what you can see here is, okay, look. I mean, I was intimidated. 
So, so, <laughs> yeah, no, so I mean, I'm nice. like, so, I'm not going to have me intimidated again. <laughs> but now that I think about it, like I didn't do anything wrong here. I put 50k, I put 50 or 100k into a company that didn't work out. And now some other investors complaining. And they're trying to tie it back to me somehow. But Jason, the, you. of course, you're going to be intimidated. The chief law enforcement officer of San Francisco is basically trying to make you the target of an investigation because of what you said publicly. Of course, that is intimidation. Guys, isn't it possible that they're just interviewing you about a fraud claim? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, what? Oh, like, really? Could, wait, wait, hold on. Like, but think about so the like, timing, Freeberg. <laughs> it's two radio, or three weeks like, after. Like, conspiracy theory, like... No, two or three know, weeks after. You know, I, guys, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. A, pol a police officer drove past my house last night. Yeah, <laughs> Freebird. Okay, look. <laughs> Wait, it's the first and only time I've ever been contacted by a law enforcement officer over an investment. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Stop committing fraud. Three hundred fifty investments. Yeah. Listen. Chesa has not had time. He's almost two years in office now, and he has not had time to successfully prosecute one murder trial. Not one, but his office has time to run down whatever they're trying to run down with J-Cal. They don't have time to prosecute the the home invader who broke into Cyan Bannister's home. Or Brian's. Or Brian's. They don't have time to do that, but they somehow have time to contact J-Cal. He tweeted the video. Let me explain what's going on here. There's two things going on. I think one of which is becoming very well understood, but the other one is not. The first one is the Gothamization of San Francisco. We understand that crime is out of control cynicism and resignation. People are just kind of given into it. It feels like San Francisco has become Gotham City. These viral videos of the robbers brazenly committing daylight theft. There is Beating no up UPS drivers in the street. There Beating is, a UPS because, driver in the because street. Because there is no consequence, okay? But there's a second thing happening, which is the Orwellianization of San Francisco government and San Francisco politics. You not only have the crime, you've got the brazen lies about the crime. You've got this insistence on this animal farm commandment that crime is falling. And if you question it, you are a bad are a person. Clansman. You're a Klansman. And then they get their the you know the Kate, the Kate Chatfields to push this out and then they get academics to back this up okay there are now they get their friends in the media and in the academy to give these spurious claims credence and then the final step is that the rich virtue signalers pay these people off they pay the, the protection money Who's paying off? The Dustin Moskovitzes, the Mike Kriegers, the Reed Hastings, and, you know, even actually the biggest contributor to Chaser right now is a guy who's under SEC indictment for the Ripple scandal. Oh, no. Yeah. Chris? Chris, yes, exactly. So people who need to curry favor either because they're, they've got their own problems or they just like to virtue Chris signal. Chris Larson. Chris then Larson fund, is Chess's biggest. Orwellian campaign. Oh, wow. That is dark. Brian Sugar released the video and that person's not going to be prosecuted. It, I mean, that is the crazy part. You get somebody on camera and they won't prosecute them. And people forget these are organized gangs that are doing this. This has been proven. This is not a poverty issue. These are not poor people who are stealing bread for their families or trying to make their rent. It's organized gangs. Right. Did you see the getaway with cars? Prop 47. Did, you, did you see the getaway cars for the Neiman Marcus heist? Yeah, they're all like the Mercedes. They're driving great, and beautiful cars with their <laughs> license plates off. This is like mob behavior. And if you give criminals, trust me, I grew up in a criminal environment in Brooklyn. If you give criminals a window, they will figure it out. You give them an opportunity. If you give them something to hack, they will hack it. Period. And you, you basically have green lighted them. Okay, listen, it's enough of us complaining about this. Uh, I am uh, going to stop complaining about this and I'm moving either let's, to let's do COVID, Texas. I'm moving to Texas or to Florida. I'm making the announcement now. Hold on. Is that for sure, JKL? Listen, I, you know, I'm in a partnership and then my partner doesn't want to be here anymore and I'm half and half. So I'm not sure why I'm here anymore. I mean, I, I think California's, I, my position right now is California is going to be on a decade long slide and I'm working for 10 more years. I decided I'm 50. I decided I'm going to go to 60. I'm going to try to invest in 100 to 200 companies a year for 10 years and then I'm done. So why would I spend 10 years in a place that is on a debt spiral? D can this be reversed in our, in the next decade? Jake I don't Al, know. How does, it yes. feel, how does it feel to be completely red pilled? <laughs> I'm purple pilled. I want to live in a pur I want to live in a reasonable place. And it yeah. seems to me that Austin and Miami are purple, you know, and, and yes. they're not communist. I don't want to live in a right wing place, alt right, and I don't want to live in a communist alt place. I want to live in an American yeah. place. I want to live in a place where Americans can talk about issues without being villainized. Period.
That's, that's the way people, I feel about this pod. You're not being villainized, <laughs> sass. Just give me a break, all right? Just be, you, people really want to know if you went to dinner with Tucker. Can you just make that statement that you, you didn't you have just, dinner with Tucker? What do we got up. next? You just made what that What do we up. got next? It was a joke. Why can't you admit if no, you did I, or not? Listen, I, I, Freebrick I, and I, I have 15 minutes. We got to go. COVID, uh, Delta, people are panicking, but the numbers keep going straight down. Pfizer says, uh, Israel says maybe Pfizer is 65% instead of 94%. 65% seems pretty great. Uh, are we at any risk? Well, I, okay, let me jump into this because I've been affected personally by it. Um, so yeah, on the last pod, I did I get, did give the stat, which was that um, at, at that point, the, the best data we had even a week ago was that the, the, the uh, Pfizer vaccine was holding it pretty well against the um, Delta variant, it had reduced the effectiveness from about 95 to 88%. That's sort of the numbers. I think uh, on Monday, Israel released a new study showing that the effectiveness of Pfizer against Delta had been reduced to 64%. Now, it, it, that's against you know getting symptoms and, and testing positive. It was still 93% against serious cases requiring hospitalization, but that 93% is down from you know 99% plus. So there has been reduced effectiveness by Delta. It's, um, it is a little bit concerning. And as if to underscore this point, someone very close to me who was double vaxxed with Pfizer just tested positive. He did test positive? Yes. <gasps> so he, he woke up yesterday morning with, um, oh. co with cold symptoms. He had um, sore throat, runny nose. Uh, but he's fine. And, and a slight fever, which then graduated into a headache. He went and got tested, and he tested positive for COVID. So I think he's fine. What city was he in when this happened? LA. Okay. Let me ask a question to Freeberg. Is it not the best possible situation? I know this sounds like a stupid question, but I am the lowest IQ guy on the pod. Is it not the best situation to have the Pfizer or whatever have this amazing, then to get a mild case of COVID and then be doubly protected? Is that in some way, an ideal situation if there is no long haul COVID? It's not really clear if that's um, going to make a difference. You know, again, like remember, um, uh, acquired immunity uh, is on a spectrum, right? So a virus can get in your nose, starts replicating. And if you got a ton of antibodies that immediately get to your nose, it'll shut down that virus before you experience anything. If that virus gets in your nose and starts replicating and you're, you've got a kind of, you know, uh, your antibodies to that specific virus, um, you know, aren't as concentrated, it's going to take your body uh, a little bit longer to fight off that virus, but you're still well ahead of the game is a way to think about it. And so, you know, to some extent, what we're seeing most likely is this Delta variant, um, having a greater escape velocity from people that have been vaccinated than, you know, the alpha variant or any of the other variants we've seen. Um, and so as a result, you know, people are getting to date, luckily, knock on wood, mostly mild and moderate symptoms and only a, a minority of people uh, that are exposed are, are getting, um, you know, that condition. Uh, but it's being tracked really closely. I mean, like, like Zach said, in Israel, they have now said that, you know, if you're uh, vaccinated with Pfizer, double vax with Pfizer, you're now 64%, um, you know, effective. And you're, you know, that, that means that if you're exposed to, to COVID, uh, there's a, a chance you can actually get these symptoms. But the hospitalization rate and the fatality rate is still way, way low because you have built up enough immunity, you've built up enough antibodies to have a good strong defense to keep things from getting out of control. And so knock on wood right now, we're still looking good in terms of fatality and hospitalizations, but there's certainly, Chamath, you know. What do you think of this situation? And Chamath, are markets kind of worrying about this? Because I'm kind of w wondering like as, as, as market participants see this stuff, are they trading it in a way that's like fearful? And does this lead to some market conditions in the next couple of days and weeks? I mean, I think that there's a very good chance that um, some politicians are going to try to use this uh, for another shutdown in the fall. Oh, for oh, fuck's I sake. I, don't see, I, I think you're right. And I think the teachers unions, the NEA and the AFT are already pu putting all sorts of demands on going back to school. I don't think this date. So first of all, I think we have to be intellectually honest that this is a bad data point. This is really the first bad data point that we've gotten. Until now, all the data has been good. The protection from the vaccines lasts longer. It had been completely holding up against the variants. But this data point from Israel is not a great data point. I want to see more of them. 
uh, more data. Yeah. But I don't think that um, th this by itself. Wait a second! Didn't is Israel only get to like fifty five, sixty percent vaccinated? Oh no, they're they're way higher. No, than no, that. no, no, they're way higher than that. Yeah, half of the infections they're seeing in Israel are children that were not vaccinated, and yeah. then the the other That's half are the other half are adults. Um, and so, if you look at the adult infection rate, it looks like it's something around um, fifteen percent. Uh, of uh, you know of these cases, or I, I forget the number, but there's some uh, statistic that shows that it's not uh, the majority being vaccinated. That there are unvaccinated people that are um, look. We're that we're going to probably we're going to probably need a booster, and we're probably going to be on a cocktail. But beyond that, I think we need to make a moral decision that we are all getting back to life as normal. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm done. I'm not. There, there, there will be booster. There will be boosters for sure. Right, like this fall. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think the, the, the question about this, this data is, does it warrant a change in policy? And I would say not yet, you know, 100% not yet. I mean, we the whole policy idea was ICUs being filled. And if you look at the stats in the United States, at the deaths, we are now at a seven day average of under 200. I think it's 150 deaths per day. Some Israel, again, I'll ask you Freebird, yeah. how many of those are with COVID versus from COVID? Yeah, it's and unclear. But like Israel hasn't had a single death in two weeks from COVID. Right. Yeah, so and what so are we talking about despite here? Despite this increase in numbers, it's it's still a you know, right, pretty low. right. It's not yeah. it's not what the media likes to portray, which is variants punching through, right? I mean, it's not like Delta variant is just sweeping through Israel. Okay. There is a slight increase in cases, and we're definitely seeing elevated cases. Here in the U.S., I mean, Delta variant is going to become the main, the dominant strain if it isn't already. Look, it's mostly sweeping through areas that have not been vaccinated, but there are now cases, I'd say mostly mild cases, of people who have been vaccinated. I mean, I think it's all the more reason why, if you're an adult, you should get vaccinated. Um, we really do need all adults, barring some sort of, um, you know, highly specific immune condition that where you, you need to be on some sort of different treatment. But almost all adults in the US really should get being vaccinated. Um, otherwise, we're going to have keep having these variants uh, yeah. sweep through. I'll tell you, uh, I, I had a really good conversation with an infectious disease doctor yesterday, who's a research specialist and, and well known in this space. And he pointed out that um, the evolutionary cycle of this virus is a function of how many people are not vaccinated. Because the more bodies the virus has to hop, the faster the, the, yes, the virus the more can, evolution it can the, do. The, the more it evolves, right? Yes. And so, um, you know, uh, certain virologists and epidemiologists will model this where they will highlight kind of the, epi uh, the evolutionary rate of the virus as a function of unvaccinated people getting infected every day. Um, and so the more people that we get vaccinated, the longer the timeline it takes for the virus to evolve and get to a breakthrough variant. And so we need to accelerate and continue to push people to get vaccinated worldwide to reduce the available pool for evolutionary um, success of the virus. Yeah, it's it's to put it in maybe layman's terms, all these unvaccinated people are basically like a giant Petri dish yeah, for the virus exactly. to keep to keep mutating. And we do need, I think, like a Marshall Plan to help all these other countries get vaccinated. I mean, I think we have enough vaccines in the US, but what have we done to help all these other countries? It directly benefits us if we reduce the size of that Petri dish. This Delta variant came from India. Why? There's like a billion plus people there who, you know, for the virus to mutate on. I mean, obviously, with a Petri dish that big, you're going to get a variant. Now there's a new variant coming out of Peru, which looks potentially scary. Now, these are not full breakthrough variants yet. But to Freeberg's point, it's just a matter of time. You guys want to guess the bottom two states in the country? I mean, it's just Mississippi, in terms of Mississippi, right? Mississippi and Alabama, Alabama, exactly. Can yeah. you imagine Mississippi and Alabama 33%? Come on, get your act together. What is I mean, it's going to um, whip through those places and you're all going to die. You're going to kill your grandparents. Is that an evangelical movement issue? Is that it's 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 uh, well, we talked about this in the last pod. There's two groups in America who are most Republican vaccine. men. Hold, no, let's be more specific. It's evangelicals and African Americans. Those are the two groups who are most. You keep saying You keep saying evangelical. What is it? How do you pronounce it? Evangelical. Evangelicals. Evangelical. Evangelicals. It's actually male Republicans. Why can't no, you? No, that's that, you're not being specific enough. Yeah, guys, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta run. Love you, Freebird. Love Have you guys. Fun. We love you, Freebird. See you later. Love you, Big Boy. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man, David Sack. And I said we open source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, Wes.
Feet. Feet. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Are I'm doing all the